I'm going to focus on the first reading, which is the book of Sirach. The book of Sirach is part of what we call wisdom literature. It was written by Jews during the, uh, during the diaspora, so they, they had gone out of Jerusalem and into Hellenistic Greek territories. So the author, realizing that the Greeks used philosophy to answer all questions, sort of adapted his belief and the, the, the scriptures and the Torah, all the beliefs of the Jews, he adapted them to Greek culture. So he put them in a format of poetry, and the format is this that we have today. It's practical aspects of being a follower of the law. Again, I'm not abandoning Jesus today, but we know from the whole history of Easter and Passion of Jesus that whatever we give up, we're going to receive back a hundredfold with persecution. There's always that little in Jesus' commentary to let us realize that the resurrection only happened after the resurrection. Excuse me, the resurrection only happened after crucifixion. So that's the, that's the balance of the Christian, to believe pain and suffering, if we offer it to God, will come with the reward of God knowing what we're doing and being aware, and he'll bless us. So I'm going to leave that there for a second. But the book of Sirach, he opens this section in, in chapter 35 with a practical insight. To keep the law is a great oblation, a great offering. And he goes on to say the practical aspects of living the Jewish life, the Torah, life of the Torah, the practical aspects really mirror the spiritual aspects. That's why we as a church, we regard the Sirach and all the wisdom literature as such an important piece of our Bible scripture because it balances with our Christian thinking. So the, the oblation that he mentions, the offerings of God, okay, he's talking about people who used to go to the temple and bring sacrificial animals or a basket of fruit or, or other sacrifices, pigeons, that were sacrificed there and offered to God, and the people would have half the sacrifice to take home, and the others would go for the the security and the uh, up, upkeep of the temple. And he mentions that the just ones, the gift of the just person enriches the altar and rises as a sweet odor before God. Okay, so what I just said, he put it in poetic terms. When, you, when they offer their sacrifices, they're burning them. They're, they're, they're putting them on the altar and they're burning them. So the smell of those, he's saying, go up as a sweet fragrance to God and they bless the person giving the sacrifice. And, and we believe that too. Um, we don't burn our sacrifices, but whatever, whatever we offer, if it's our help or if it's the prayers of some, for somebody else or if it's a sacrificial walk, offering at the altar, Whatever we offer comes back to us because it goes to God and it will not be forgotten as a gift to God from us. Just as the one sacrifice is most pleasing, it will never be forgotten. In the generous spirit, we pay homage to the Lord. You see, so as we live our lives, this is Sirach, but it sounds very Christian, as we live our lives, being considerate of other people, as we live our lives offering our prayers to God, we get blessings. They come back to us. They're not forgotten. Each contribution given with a cheerful countenance, so we have to be positive, even in our suffering, that we're offering it to God, pays what well, he says, your tithes, pays your support of the temple. 
in the spirit of joy. So as we go through life and offering gifts in God's name to charity, to one another, even bringing a, a piece of cake to an, a neighbor, or bringing a, a, a meal to, to a person, whatever we do in charity comes back to us. And as we do it, we should enjoy it. Be joyful. Not give a gift with a sour face, but give a gift with a positive countenance. So it comes back as a revelation to the world that as we're living our Christian life, we're being rewarded. And as our Christian life is difficult at, at times, but we're still living it, we'll be rewarded. And the reward is not going to come at the end of life, necessarily. It will come then, we, we know that. But just knowing that we're doing God's will by charity, by prayer, by visitation, that we're doing God's will and our own wish to be with that person that we're serving should give us joy. And the scriptures, even in the Old Testament, says that's how you get reimbursed. So our priorities are very important. How we prioritize living the daily Christian life is very important. Our attitude is very important. And I think it was Pope Francis, I'm going to paraphrase him because I can't remember it exactly. Priests should never have sour faces. Priests should never show forth a sour puss. He said it in his own words. Why? Because we're here proclaiming the good news. Whether it's praying for someone who is ill, praying for peace in the world, whatever the intention of our prayer is, we're in concert with God and we're connecting with God, proclaiming the good news. Now I say, Pope Francis referred to priests, but that's us, all of us. All of us are meant to live our Christian life with a smile, with a positive attitude. And there are times in which we can't smile, and there are times in which things are troublesome. We're still called to have a joyous spirit. And there are times in the hospital, funeral home, on the street, we can't smile about everything. But the fact that we're there doing God's will, offering praise to him, we're doing it with a generous heart and a joyful heart. And God knows that. Sirach goes on to say, the Lord is the one who always repays, and he will give you back sevenfold, because the Lord is the judge of justice. So how practical Sirach was, telling people to live the life connected to the Torah, the law, but how practical it is for us to know that Jesus' life reflected this. He did good, he loved, and sometimes, and maybe with that new movie, The Chosen, some art paintings, we see Jesus with a smile on his face. I look at this first window on my right, Jesus with the children. And now you know he had to be smiling when he's with those children. When I'm at Mass at, at Cabrini, especially the 1030, a lot of kids come. A lot of kids come. And the other day, it was Pentecost Sunday, the parents knew enough to go into the large room and get little chairs, little, little children's chairs, that they sit in for religious ed. And the parents brought them out into the foyer so the kids who make noise and run around can sit there during Mass and observe, because the doors are closed, the glass doors, but the sound system is clear. No, I think that's a hoot. I, I love that. You know, and any, anybody, this, this might be touching the sore bone, but it's too bad. Anybody who's grumpy because of the sound of children at Mass, <laughs> I want to say, can go to hell. I'm not going to say that, but basically that's what they're asking for for themselves. 
Because they are the future of the church, and they are the church, and they're the youngest part of the church. So we should rejoice and be glad that they don't sing songs of praise, but their lives, by their interaction with one another, is a song of praise. That's the scriptures. So interesting how the scriptures can be applied to us from Sirach to the New Testament for our priorities, our everyday living in a positive, spiritual, and sometimes humorous way. Thank you.